I will now take a few minutes to set the context for today's webinar. As you might be aware, India's presidency of the G20 is an opportunity to demonstrate that policies and practice adopted and propagated by cities indeed have powerful implication to achieve global agendas of development. U20, a group, leaders, a group of leaders from the G20 cities, in the sixth edition of in the sixth uh, in its sixth edition this year, aims to move from intention to action and to draft a roadmap for global change that will be driven by cities by closing the gaps between policy and practice at all levels. I would now like to quote Patrick Giddicks, the father of town planning. A city is more than just a place in space, it's a drama in time. Streets and public spaces are the center of our life in the cities, not only providing safe and comfortable spaces to rest, play, travel, and spend time, but gives an opportunity to experience, engage, and interact. These are the places of cultural and social exchange, thriving informal sectors, and act as environments for interaction and exchange of ideas that impact the quality of the urban environment. However, there is an increasing need to design streets and public spaces through an inclusive and citizen-centric approach, which breaks down the barriers that ex exclude persons with disability, women, children, elderly, and urban poor, thereby providing equal access to streets and public spaces. In resonance with this pressing issue, the priority area of U20, Urban 20, championing local identity, we believe it is critical to share knowledge, learn from each other, and grow together to plan, design, and strategize better for all the marginalized groups. The webinar today aims to sensitize and motivate city authorities to prioritize the rights and well being of all, including women, children, elderly, and persons with disability, thereby empowering them to actively contribute into socioeconomic growth of the city. Taking you through a, bit, a brief overview of our agenda today, we'll begin. The uh, webinar is broadly divided into two parts. The first part will have presentations from the implemented innovation and best practices across, across the country. The second part will have an interactive panel discussion and a brief Q&A session with the audience. We will conclude the webinar with the summarization and a way forward. Before taking, uh, without taking any more time, I would like to now move to the next, uh, the first part. I would like to begin with the first part of the agenda. And would like to request Ms. Vidya Mohan, uh, Vidya Mohan Kumar, founder, Urban Design Collective, for her uh, to present us with the, with the first presentation for, the, for today. Is my screen visible? Yes, Madam. Hello? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you to all the organizers uh, for the opportunity to share this vertical of our work that we call Accessible Cities. Um, our work under this uh, vertical is organized and conducted under three components, covering audits, implementation, and capacity building as a three-pronged strategy to achieving accessible cities. Today, I'll walk you through uh, some of our projects under these three components, uh, starting with uh, the Accessible Quarter in Chennai. So the Right of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016 mandates that all government buildings and public spaces be made accessible for persons with disabilities to be able to navigate on any day. Uh, this really forms the basis of uh, most of our work under this sector. Uh, in this particular project, the Marina Beach, uh, which is one of the most preferred recreational spots in the city of Chennai, uh, this particular project aims to make a 400 meter stretch fully accessible uh, as a pilot project. Um, the issues and recommendations uh, are suggested as part of this audit were presented under three sections. One of them was the access to the quarter itself. Uh, the second part was barriers along the circuit. 
And the third part included missing links to amenities. Now, our recommendations uh, also for this audit varied uh, in terms of providing um, you know, minor retrofits, uh, design solutions, as uh, as and uh, and including both uh, retrofits to civil work as well as including new civil work components itself. Uh, this project is also premised on several other projects that I will walk you through, uh, and we'll come back to this a little later. Uh, this is another interesting project. It was an uh, office space assessment. This is a public uh, government building, uh, the State Commissionerate for the Differently Abled. Uh, the commission, Commissioner uh, of this um, um, particular uh, department at that time felt that uh, this public building, um, which stands for the welfare of the differently abled, needs to be a model accessible building on its own. And hence, uh, we were invited to do this uh, access audit. Uh, we eventually ended up giving recommendations to modify the office space so that uh, it functions well, uh, not just as an architectural space, but also uh, to be able to uh, ensure that 50% of the workstations are accessible by wheelchair users. Uh, moving on to the second component, which is implementation. Uh, we're looking at a streetscape design project that we did, one of the earliest ones that we did in 2013, um, completed in 2016, the Harrington Road project in Chennai. Uh, this project uh, had all the basic principles, streamlined carriageways, uh, reorganizing parking, and providing adequate and unobstructed sidewalk for barrier-free access. Uh, one of the most gratifying things about this uh, project, which was completed, is a uh, testimonial from a, a wheelchair user who lives on the street who said that this was the first street that he could actually go from end to end on a wheelchair uh, without uh, any assistance. Um, these are some before and after pictures of what the street looks like. Uh, again, the street had about eight schools, so ensuring child safety uh, for school children that were walking to school or cycling to school was also a critical aspect of this project. Uh, this is the Chennai Mega Streets project that we are working on currently uh, with Architecture Red. Uh, project is currently in tender stage, but it's a it's it's a larger neighborhood revitalization project uh, viewed in the in the through the lens of streetscape design. We carry the learnings of the Harrington Road project uh, into our streetscape designs for this project as well. Um, and this is uh, the beach access pathway, uh, which uh, garnered a lot of attention uh, over the past few months. Um, this was a very challenging project that we uh, got a chance to work on. Uh, it took uh, six years uh, plus uh, for the implementation to be completed simply because there was no precedent for a project like this. It needed to be CRZ compliant um, and a walkway to be built on the beach so that persons with disabilities can access the beach independently on all days. The materiality of the project uh, also needed to reflect the weather conditions of a seaside environment like this. Uh, our design provided a mid-landing deck um, as well as a viewing sea deck where people uh, could park themselves uh, and enjoy the breeze. Uh, the pathway extends from the road edge all the way up to the high tide line. Um, and uh, was recently inaugurated in uh, November with a lot of a lot of publicity. Um, and uh, this is another project that we uh, got to complete uh, last year in May 2022, um, also inaugurated uh, very shortly after that. Uh, this is the Museum of Possibilities and the Maguchi Cafe. Uh, this is a demonstration center set up uh, at the State Commissionerate for Differently Abled in Chennai. Uh, it, it was uh, premised on uh, creating three modules, the Live, Work and Play module. Uh, the Live module included includes an accessible home with assistive devices to demonstrate independent living for persons with disabilities. Likewise, the Play and Work modules also include uh, assistive devices for enabling uh, persons with disability to enjoy the uh, the joys and banalities of uh, regular life as we know it. Um, uh, Complementary to this project, we had also proposed uh, a cafe on the top floor uh, of this museum space uh, to be, uh, and we conceptualized this as a training and vocational center for about 15 to 20 persons with disabilities on skills pertaining to the hospitality and food industry. Um, the project is a very vibrant uh, space at the moment. Uh, Vidya Sagar is the NGO that uh, is uh, operating and maintaining the space right now. Uh, they've um, 
totally embrace the space and it's very heartening to see how they use it. Uh, these are some pictures at the bottom here of the cafe, which also functions as a public event space. It's now, a, uh, it, it, it it performs as a forum uh, for persons with uh, disabilities to come together as a community, voice themselves and share, uh, you know, experiences in this space uh, as a backdrop. Um, and lastly, on the capacity building component, uh, we have been working um, since 2016 uh, with several ULBs uh, in Tamil Nadu. This is uh, with uh, starting with the, the Greater Chennai Corporation. Um, this was an initiative that we had worked on with ITDP, in fact, uh, to train engineers uh, on public space design, including various aspects of uh, creating safe streets for all. We continued this effort uh, more recently and expanded to covering about um, 14 uh, corporations as well as 15 special grade municipalities across Tamil Nadu. The key objectives of these trainings uh, that we conduct for ULBs is to give a hands-on experience on street documentation, road safety audits, access audits, as well as analysis on basic, uh, as well as analysis as a basic requirement for taking up NMP projects in their cities. Um, I will close with this. Uh, we are Urban Design Collective. We are a collaborative platform based in Chennai, uh, working to create livable cities through participatory planning. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya, uh, for presenting such a comprehensive outlook towards uh, mainstreaming disability inclusion into every aspect of the streets, uh, every aspect of city development. Our next presenter will. They uh, bring uh, examples uh, from the uh, Silicon City of uh, India. Uh, Mr. Akash Hingrani, co-founder and principal architect, uh, Oasis Design uh, Inc. Uh, Akash, over to you. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. So this uh, project is clean. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this topic, uh, nurturing inclusive design itself, was uh, uh, quite a you know, uh, uh, it set us wondering like uh, inclusive design, the way uh, we understand it conventionally to make our cities, uh, our streets, our public spaces uh, accessible for everyone. But uh, we thought uh, we'll probably target a broader kind of definition for inclusivity and uh, look at how uh, open spaces in the cities can actually be inclusive, not only for uh, differently abled uh, people of different ages, etc., but also how uh, you know cities could bring in nature, culture, heritage, all of that uh, uh, natural uh, features uh, into uh, into the public realm, so to speak. So uh, we'll right dive in. Um, now, uh, typically, you know, public open spaces, they have a better experiential quality. I mean, malls are trying to um, kind of become the uh, places where people go and hang out uh, in absence of uh, good public uh, space. And if there, there's like a nice promenade in the city that's more uh, equitable, more people can access it and more fun. Um, the WHO has defined uh, the standard of uh, you know public open space as around nine square meters per person, and uh, there has been enough uh, written about you know the kind of quality of public space, how it uh, uh, affects your mental health in the city. Now, when we start looking at uh, what our public spaces in the city look like, how do they function? Typically, you know, uh, most of them uh, with parking get cut off from the actual accessibility becomes an issue. Visibility sometimes is not there. So it's not good enough just to have public space, but also look at qualitative uh, you know, uh, aspects of it. Like water is such a, a, a dreamy kind of a, you know, thing to have in a city, but most of the cities, uh, uh, you know, we uh, struggle to manage uh, water systems. And the quality of public space near water could be uh, uh, like, you know, redefine the whole thing. Now, uh, typically a city, uh, we're looking at about 25% under roads and about uh, 
you know, uh, 15% under green. So like 40%. Now, whether we plan it only for vehicles to move or we can look at, you know, um, these uh, public open spaces becoming better for people. Now, uh, some pictures showing you, you know, what we have encountered in our work uh, when we uh, get a particular city to do. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the drain actually is your footpath and you're walking next to a wall. And uh, even that experience uh, is, you know, sometimes uh, hampered with these kind of uh, covers. So, uh, with so many drains still we have flooding. So there's some problem, you know, how we're looking at streets, the whole concept needs to be revisited. Uh, now with a lot of cities uh, investing in the uh, uh, metro, like this is, uh, this diagram is from Delhi showing you, you know, how um, the cannot place area, we have around six and a half people uh, footfall per day. And what we land up seeing is lots and lots of parked cars, even if you were to come on the metro, still you'll be greeted with so many cars. So accessibility, now what, what does one car is like 6,000 rupees a month if you were to uh, charge it and the same space if you were to rent it. So uh, one and a half lakhs a month. So economic wise, um, you know, uh, the way the city uh, feels, everything uh, kind of depends on how we look at our cities who are, who are we designing for. So um, are we designing for, you know, just vehicles or are we designing for people? And we typically have people telling us that, you know, nobody prefers to walk. Now, why would anybody want to walk when this is the, you know, quality of walking space that uh, is on offer in the cities. Uh, I wouldn't walk anywhere if this is all I am going to encounter. And eventually everybody gets into a car. Now, uh, this is what all of our cities are lining up with. And, you know, when we did an analysis, 60 to 65% of the trips we realized were um, actually less than five kilometers, which could be easily, uh, you know, kind of, transferred, which we were just walking and that modal shift would actually, you know, decongest your cities, make them more walkable. And everybody is putting up these fancy buildings. What happens uh, at the ground level? I mean, when you have a, a, a three lane main road, a, a service road, a service road to the service road, and how does a person negotiate all this at the pedestrian level? I mean, these are things that, you know, we needed to uh, kind of uh, flag out, like inclusive. I mean, at least my city should uh, be designed to be inclusive for human beings. Human beings, uh, we need uh, quality public wealth. And uh, this has been our journey. Like we, we realized that, you know, when we want to dabble around in, uh, in uh, public rep, be it street design or uh, uh, any other, uh, the whole gamut is uh, linked to landscape. We need to understand uh, urban design. We need to look at transportation, the engineering aspects. And therefore we pers like personally believe that it's a multidisciplinary kind of a approach that we have uh, you know, developed over time, uh, underpinned by sustainability, we started looking at mobility and water across uh, all our works, uh, which went on to street design and parks and waterfront and greenways and smart cities. And uh, each city, we've been working in so many, but each city, we have a different kind of a flavor, a different heritage, a different scale, different set of natural features. So all of that, when, you know, we kind of look at and try to contextualize our approaches. And we have been also um, kind of uh, helping out with the uh, guidelines for storm water and for um, other things. We, uh, the last one, we uh, had this uh, opportunity to partner with NIUA to put up this uh, 75 uh, projects which were built out in defining uh, India's public realm. Now, creating a biophilic city, this is uh, in Pune, where you know you see a nice street, you see a cycle track, you see areas where people can sit and walk and enjoy. But you know, like when you want to do this, you the under layers, like you have to solve parking, you have to you know figure out how to do your uh, stormwater management, you have to figure out uh, what do you want to do with your uh, the areas where the trees are there. If there's a park next door, how do you want to interact with that? So it's like the domino effect where you know you want to do one street but you will actually have to do it all in so whatever it takes to uh, 
uh, fix your public realm is, is the kind of approach that uh, you know we typically have evolved over time. This is in Chhatarpur, like uh, the new metro station. The metro started in Delhi, and uh, you would land into a, a, a parking lot full of cars. So we took it up on ourselves uh, to start you know looking at options, and then finally I managed to put this project through. So a parking lot which earlier used to exist today has become like a nice landscape plaza where you have uh, you know a space for people to uh, not only to sit and enjoy but also uh, all the desire lines are kept intact so that there are you know uh, you can move through the space uh, quickly at the same time all your paratransit is lined up and uh, it kind of you know enables you to uh, look at the city properly so inclusivity right from the metro station, but this was way back in 2010, we put up the for the uh, earlier round of streets design in the city. And that time also we had to fight with uh, the engineers to reduce our curb heights and you know uh, uh, help us to create barrier-free uh, ramp situations or steps. So the whole journey over time and now um, in the second round of street design in Delhi, we're doing some of uh, these streets where we're trying to reduce the extra carriageway, optimize the carriageway, look at you know uh, how we can uh, carve out more space for uh, uh, creating that experience. So whatever the you know the uh, spots like this one under a flyover which was used for parking. I mean, if we could somehow convince authorities to reimagine this as a public space and uh, do something with the parking, settle it somewhere, uh, look at options where we could, you know, probably uh, use the um, the existing, um, let's say, un, uh, un, um, kept landscape to help us to do stormwater. And, you know, uh, I was discussing this with my team, like the kind of conviction over time that we bring now to our projects, I mean, ripping out, uh, you know, tarred, uh, uh, road at the ring road in Delhi to put in a, 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 a kind of a, a system whereby we are going to uh, you know handle all this storm water happening there naturally and then um, convincing the authorities um, as to this is the right way to go so that comes um, with some level of uh, you know uh, time uh, uh, that we have uh, spent negotiating all these. So uh, creating, you know, transferring a situation like that into a finished product where we could actually now skate around and uh, enjoy the space. So, Akash, um, I would, uh, Akash uh, can you please uh, like uh, uh, wind it up in the next one minute? We are already over time. Yeah, so this is Pune, um, where again, I'll just show you the quick transformation. And uh, this is in uh, Coimbatore, where we're showing you the, you know, and uh, like quickly, you know, when we uh, landed up in Coimbatore, we realized that all these uh, different, different uh, things that we do in different projects, we had to do it together. So uh, the Coimbatore project was around lakes. We wanted to create a destination um, for, so the lakes were not even visible. So we had to open up the views and, you know, the water part of it, I told you, and how the whole system comes through stakeholders, you know, a systems approach, looking at the overall drainage pattern, all the water studies on the lakes where the visibility of the lakes will happen or the urban and ecological character of the lakes the um, you know low income neighborhoods which will uh, kind of open up and then uh, and the conventional way of doing uh, hard edges i mean giving way to uh, if we could do an alternate live edge so all these are pictures of the project where we have shown like you know how a lake could become a public space so similarly like imagine all these people i mean where would they go earlier i mean this is the uh, the lower one shows you what's happening now so water treatment uh, wastewater biodiversity um, native um, plantations uh, you know natural edges all of it came um, together to create uh, what we call the, you know, uh, this was a space under a flyover which was lying, uh, which we converted and now it's like become the city's new hub. And uh, uh, the, we're so happy to be part of this change and now they're celebrating with laser shows and boating and things like that. So the impact of the overall development. 
and uh, similarly we've just started working in kashmir srinagar where we again looking at a whole area based uh, uh, like this whole precinct around lal chowk is what we are planning to convert into that even the uh, clock tower will be renovated and uh, like uh, with your mention we are also part of the chennai thing so that's another story for another day thank you so much thank you thank you so much uh, akash for bringing so many different perspectives uh, and in fact a very holistic view uh, towards the entire inclusive approach and highlighting so many uh, beautiful examples and work happening across the country uh, with this we would like to move to our third presentation it's a joint presentation uh, it's a joint presentation made by mr deepak and uh, dr kavita murugan um, on uh, Uh, the work of the Mindry Foundation uh, in various part of the country. Uh, over to you, ma'am and sir. Thank you. I'll uh, share my screen for sharing the presentation. Hope it is visible. I hope the presentation is visible. Can yes, yes, come? it's visible. Right, yes, you. it's visible. So, LTM Mindry uh, was uh, uh, recently uh, formed uh, thanks to the merger of uh, two IT services and consultancy firms. Uh, one is Mindry, and the other is L N T Infotech. So, LTM Mindry is now the fifth largest uh, IT services uh, firm. Uh, among uh, so, I'm part of the CSR team at LTM Mindry. and uh, in collaboration with various ngos uh, we execute uh, csr projects in the focus areas of education health and wellness skilling and uh, environment cutting across uh, three of these focus areas which is uh, education health and wellness is skilling is uh, a common theme that cuts across which is uh, to positively impact the persons with disability that kind of uh, set us on our journey of this uh, disabled friendly park in uh, bangalore uh, that was inaugurated about 6 uh, 7 months ago um, and uh, in in terms of the context uh, this is uh, karnataka's first exclusive park for children with uh, disability um so i'm just trying to hide yeah yeah no mind So, um, in terms of uh, the context uh, of the place where this uh, first exclusive park for children with disabilities has been developed, uh, this is inside uh, Jawahar Bal Bhavan within Kabam Park, one of the uh, one of the biggest lung spaces in uh, Bangalore. Uh, uh, Jawahar Bal Bhavan is a place where children uh, can utilize uh, a toy train, one of the oldest uh, toy trains. plus uh, there is a uh, park for uh, regular children and a boating club an auditorium and some play area however uh, in this 2 acre park uh, there was no facility for children with disabilities to uh, play and it was not accessible and therefore uh, our target audience is 2.4 lakh children with disability uh, we uh, worked on this project with a budget of uh, 3 crores started in uh, april 2021 and uh, we inaugurated the same in june 2022 some of the partners who worked with us are uh, listed here so uh, in terms of the project uh, broad uh, uh, detail uh, one of the things was uh, uh, the concept and approval it was uh, approved in 2019 uh, however uh, due to covid uh, work got stalled and started only in uh, 2021 uh the work was initiated under the bangalore smart city uh, initiatives where there is a lot of other work going on but completely funded by uh, lti mindry the work was executed through pjb engineers rr architects were the architects uh shortlisting of play equipment uh, vendors happened based on the features the safety pricing and therapeutic needs of course uh, we tied up with and partnered with the association of people with disability for initiating all this uh, procurement and collaboration with respective vendors as required uh, apd also conducted an accessibility audit and uh, suggested certain improvements which were implemented and ultimately the park was handled inaugurated on uh, 25th of june by the governor of karnataka and subsequently we have handed it over to the balbon society of course some maintenance is happening as we speak 
So what are the facilities available at the park? And you will get a glimpse of it in the coming slides. Uh, it is a combination of all of this, which is there are some physical games uh, like uh, climbing uh, ropes and so on. There are sensory games, there are intellectually sim simulating games, and there's a therapeutic area as well. Some of the equipment were customized, uh, was specially designed. Uh, some of the equipment was imported, but 80% of the equipment was uh, made in India with uh, the help of uh, the local uh, vendors. Has the wheelchair accessible entrance gate, the pathways and seating area. Most importantly, uh, across the park, uh, in order to ensure that uh, children do not uh, get injured, uh, there is uh, the colorful non-slippery EPDM flooring on uh, level ground, which is also embellished in some places with child-friendly uh, painting. There is tactile flooring for visually challenged, uh, uh, visually impaired children to navigate. Uh, there are swings of different varieties, uh, swings with the flat seats and bucket seats for children with minimal body support. Also, there is a net swing, uh, which is unique, uh, which is accessible for children who want to swing but are unable to sit, uh, sit so that they can enjoy the swing while uh, lying down. And of course, uh, equipment that creates sound like wind chimes and uh, bells. So uh, uh, just in terms of the timeline, starting from the bottom right, uh, the work started in April 2021 with the design in place. Then the area was the mark, the foundation was laid, uh, the construction of the mound, which is one of the uh, unique uh, uh, heart of the uh, uh, project uh, was constructed. Uh, then there was the zone demarcated. Equipment installation happened, seating area, installation, painting, artwork, tactile play pathways, and ultimately what you see is the aerial view of what we call as the turtle-shaped disabled-friendly park that was inaugurated in June 2022 at the hands of the governor of Karnataka. So some uh, photos from uh, the inauguration uh, event where you can see a glimpse of the equipment as well. So the idea was that, okay, we uh, have uh, developed this park with the help of various partners in Bangalore, but can we do that in every state where every state where LTI Mind Tree operates? Now with that intent, uh, after completing this project, uh, we have already started work on a similar park, but uh, rather than the exclusivity that is offered in Bangalore for children with disabilities, given the environment uh, that uh, per, uh, that prevails in uh, Jawahar Balbavan. In Kolkata, we have started the uh, work on the second park, which is an inclusive park. And uh, at this point, I will uh, request uh, Dr. Kavita to come in and uh, share more details about the inclusive park. Thank you so much, Deepakji. Uh, please allow me to share the screen. Is the screen visible? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, it's an honor to be uh, presenting at this uh, forum on uh, inclusive public spaces and streets. Uh, I'm going to be talking on behalf of LTI Mindtree, um, uh, New Kolkata Development Authority and CBM, an international organization which works for empowerment of persons with disabilities um, on a project which uh, I'm involved as a universal design specialist, access auditor and trainer. Um, and this is indeed an inclusive park that is being designed at and you know ex uh, executed at uh, Palkata, like uh, Deepakji said. The whole uh, the brief was about the brief was about creating the which was an exclusive park for children with disabilities. Uh, this time, uh, Mindtree as well as CBM uh, was the guiding organization to uh, Mindtree. Uh, together, uh, decided to have an inclusive park so that 
uh, no child is uh, you know left out as well as you know there is mainstreaming happening by inculcating the values of inclusion right from the young age so uh, there was a need of a park which could facilitate social and physical inclusion of children with and without disabilities which could uh, in a way uh, create awareness on uh, disability as well as the realities around disability uh, challenge uh, and break social stigma promote social harmony as well as uh, uh, address the aspect of gender inclusion through design and uh, at the same time also responds uh, respond to the cultural and the environmental context um, to, to meet these goals uh, you know having green landscape which again nurtures good health well-being was of course one of the main uh, principles apart from that barrier free environment so that all kinds of uh, user groups irrespective of being persons with disabilities or senior citizens or pregnant ladies or children um, you know in prams or, um, or young mothers etc could use the park uh, the need was also to have an inclusive community space along with a play area so that uh, fostering of uh, inclusion and uh, you know uh, fostering togetherness and interaction with uh, the society could happen uh, sensory play was also included uh, keeping in mind the therapeutic needs as well as all the amenities facilities that are required such as restrooms drinking water fountains resting benches etc were also included and uh, to bring in the environmental aspect sustainability was also one of the principles that was kept in mind so like i said the guiding principles have been universal design accessibility and sustainability uh, keeping in mind the uh, three uh, uh, sdg goals uh, uh, you know forwarding gender equality reducing inequalities and sustainable cities and communities the broad activities and spaces that have been included are sensory zones, uh, play areas, typically, as well as community space, which can, like I said, foster interaction and exchange between uh, persons or groups uh, of uh, with uh, disabilities as well as without disabilities. Um, coming to the uh, to the environmental aspect, uh, a conscious effort has been made to uh, bring in sustainability. Uh, to use of solar lamps or recycling certain kind of waste material as well as you know use simple things to uh, create uh, uh, the uh, the whole awareness about environmental sustainability talking about the site so it's uh, the site is about uh, a little less than an acre and surrounded by residential society uh, while at the same time being uh, abutting the main road and it has uh, two entrances, like you can see the main entrance here and the secondary entrance. And while preparing the brief, keeping in mind the play uh, area, as well as the sensory garden, but also a community space in the form of an amphitheater was visualized. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the green spaces were intertwined between these zones so that the required sound buffering or visual privacy or, uh, you know, um, uh, enough place for uh, for uh, play uh, could be facilitated uh, through uh, a good kind of zoning. Service blocks, which included all the accessible service areas were uh, located at equidistance and uh, the entrances as well as the entire circulation within the park was uh, ensured uh, to be accessible by making it uh, step free or wherever there were steps, uh, you know, alternative, uh, alternative approach to ramps have been uh, taken into consideration. So this finally became, after a number of iterations, this finally became the master plan, where you can see this becomes the entrance, and this is the main entrance, whereas this is the secondary entrance. So there is equal, uh, you know, kind of opportunity to approach the park from all sides, uh, a seamless kind of a level free um, circulation path, jogging track, as well as, you know, wheeling track, um, binds all the spaces in the park together, uh, wherein you can see this part is the play area, which is, which has, Again, uh, of uh, uh, shock resilient or uh, you know uh, resilient floor in the form of EPDM, green spaces uh, nicely tucked between these sensory zones and play areas. And here in the uh, in on the right side, you can see is the amphitheater or the community space, uh, which also has an information kiosk uh, with the idea of um, uh, uh, maybe providing digital displays. Uh, which can inform about new uh, uh, opportunities or government schemes or any kind of uh, awareness building uh, for persons with disabilities. Um, 
these are some of the glimpses of the uh, kind of uh, you know uh, design that has been envisaged so the entire uh, boundary of the park has been designed in a way that uh, gender uh, safety and gender inclusion can uh, the principles can be followed so there is transparency and one can see into the park or outside and just make keeping the uh, making the place uh, uh, a safe place to be in uh, for women as well as for uh, girls um, an information kiosk, like I said, which again becomes a backdrop to the amphitheater and the amphitheater, um, uh, I have some pictures here, which serves as an accessible kind of a space uh, where sufficient space has been left out for wheelchairs to uh, get in at any level. And uh, this amphitheater gradually leads to a sensory mound and a play mound, which again has a lot of play equipment. Uh, the play equipment area or the play zone, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, just, yes. Yes, yes. So again, has multiple types of play equipments, which uh, which would cater to children with and without uh, disabilities, both so they can play together. Uh, service blocks, which have uh, accessible drinking water fountains, accessible toilets, as well as signages and uh, other kind of uh, um, uh, first aid needs or feeding rooms, etc. This is a view of the sensory park, uh, which also has uh, a lot of sensory play equipments. Um, yeah, so that's that's about this park. Thank you so much. I can also see Mansoor in the audience, and Mansoor is also, you know, uh, the the uh, one of the most uh, motivated team members from the CBM who has been on this park and uh, devotedly working to make it uh, uh, happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Deepak and Kavita ji, uh, for taking us through two wonderful in initiatives uh, at two different part of the at two different parts of the uh, country. Uh, with this, uh, I would also like to encourage all the speakers. There are a few questions in the question and uh, answer box. Uh, so you may like to address uh, the ones which are directed towards you. Um, and uh, with this, we come to an end to the first part of the webinar. Uh, thank you to all the presenters for taking time and effort um, in sharing uh, the best practices happening across the country uh, today with us. Uh, we will now move to the second part of the webinar, uh, which is the uh, interactive panel discussion. I invite Ms. Sophia Islam from the Institute of Transportation and Development Policy to moderate the session and take the we uh, webinar forward. Over to you, Sophia. Thank you, Kanika, for moderating the first half of the session. And thank you to all the presenters for taking us through the wonderful projects across the country. It is wonderful to see inclusive design approaches being prioritized all across the country. And importantly to know that historically urbanization has been considered as a cause of poverty and exclusion. And today as millions of people live in dense urban areas, it is very important to drive the right kind of growth that is sustainable, inclusive and equitable. On that note, let us now move into the second part of the webinar, which is the panel discussion. I would, I would now like to introduce the experienced set of experts that we have for the discussion today. Three of the presenters would be joining the panel discussion. Ms. Vidya Mohan Kumar, founder and principal Urban Design Collective. Mr. Akash Ingurani, co-founder and principal Oasis Designs and Dr. Kavita Murukar, co-founder Design Bridge Diversity and Inclusion Foundation, universal design expert and principal at Bharti Vidya Pitt College of Architecture, Pune. We also have four experts joining in the discussion, Dr. Shalini Mishra, social safeguards and gender specialist with the city's program of NIUA, Mr. Pratik Khandelwal, founder and managing director of an accessibility startup, Ramp My City, Ms. Shivani Shah, co-founder and CEO, Accessible, which is an early age startup aiming to make the world more accessible and inclusive for all. And Mr. Abhinav Kaushal, who is an architect with the Varanasi Smart City Limited. The detailed briefs will be posted in the chat box shortly. And with that, a very warm welcome to all of you. And thank you for taking out the time from your busy schedules to join us today for this webinar. I'm sure given the pressing need to nurture the inclusive design of streets and public spaces, this is a topic that all of you would be delighted to talk about today. So we've identified a set of questions which we will use to guide the discussion. 
I would request all of you to keep your answers brief within three minutes to ensure we have an engaging discussion with all of you. And while we'll be directing these questions to only some of you, please do feel free to drop your thoughts in the chat box if you find it relevant. Also, I would like to point out we have more than 100 attendees connected with us here, and I would request all the attendees to add to the discussion in the chat box and drop your questions in the Q&A box. We will take these up at the end. With that, let's get started. As I mentioned earlier, we saw several examples of inclusive design approaches in the first half of the webinar and importantly pointed through the three presentations that there are several factors at play that that uh, contribute towards creating inclusive places. And over the last decade, India has seen a shift in the design of streets and public spaces as people-centric design approaches have become more mainstream. But with respect to this, do you think the need for inclusive design has been equally mainstreamed? And on this question, I would like to invite Ms. Vidya, followed by Mr. Akash and Dr. Kavita, to share their thoughts and open the discussion. Over to you, Vidya. Um, thanks, Sophia. Um, it's a very pertinent question, but uh, I, I, I think it's not as mainstreamed yet. Um, I, I mean, <clears throat> been practicing for eighteen plus years, and um, I think we are at a stage where we can comfortably say that uh, you know um, there is a consciousness towards creating uh, streets that are for pedestrians. A lot of cities have been taking the initiative. We we do see some wonderful street designs uh, in many of our cities. Uh, however, um, there are still a lot of um, errors. Um, I think it's it's uh, more a lack of uh, awareness, uh, at least from my experience um, and from all the capacity building uh, initiatives that we've taken up with several ULBs uh, across the state of Tamil Nadu. Um, once you kind of bring it to the attention of the engineers, they're able to uh, sort of, you know, grasp the idea of it. Uh, I do feel that there is still a lot of uh, mainstreaming that is pending on this particular topic. Um, Inclusion is uh, is we're not as we're not there as 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 much as we would like uh, to be there. Um, and that's 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 really just my opinion. Like, Akash, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Yeah, while I agree with uh, what Vidya is saying, and uh, you know there are serious issues about capacity in terms of uh, you know understanding the i mean there are enough rule books by the way uh, that have been prescribed to achieve uh, you know uh, inclusivity in every uh, every which way but uh, how much of it is uh, actually implemented on ground what is the awareness in the client body who's supervising what is the awareness in the design team uh, which is executing so all of that is something that uh, still needs a lot of work. One uh, example that I would like to cite is, you know, uh, we when we do street design, we have to create uh, some entries for, let's say, properties. So that's like the motorable part of the of the pavement, which the car will negotiate to go into a particular property. So both the edges of this we are supposed to put in bullets so that the uh, you know vehicles don't come on to the uh, to the footpaths so to speak but uh, the whole issue of uh, you know the distance of these uh, bullets that we place uh, should be something that you know should allow the wheelchair should allow the cyclist should allow uh, all these uh, things to go through uh, that's like the basic common sense to uh, you know uh, thing but uh, typically i mean in the in the uh, thing of preventing even uh, motorized two wheelers like scooters or motorcycles i mean the engineers tend to start putting the bullets at such a uh, narrow kind of a spacing which i mean defeats the whole purpose of creating a whole infrastructure for let's say the cyclists to move through because their logic is that if we give them more space, then we'll have uh, scooters and uh, motorbikes coming onto the cycle track. So, I mean, we're still kind of, you know, grappling with these kind of problems as to how do we ensure that, you know, the standards get built out and get accepted across 
and what kind of you know uh, uh, systems do we put in place so that uh, if there is a breach like this then what happens and you know uh, cctv or something something so we'll have to uh, as a community of designers i think we still need to uh, tackle these uh, problems Um, I think what um, Akash is also alluding to is um, is uh, public behavior um, and general awareness on such initiatives. So on on the one hand, we do have um, you know uh, cities that are trying to make uh, you know better streets, and uh, there are mistakes that we see. I mean, a, a lot of times, I'm sure you've all encountered a street that has a ramp access, but then the ramp may not have been executed correctly, or it may have a wrong slope. Uh, this is something that we come across very frequently when we do audits of public spaces. Like most of the times, it's just that the ramp is in a, in a wrong um, you know ratio, uh, and so on. Um, and of course, you know the landing is not. Concerned considered correctly and you know uh, the safety aspect of the landing is not considered so these are i feel like we're still in a very trial and error phase uh, in terms of uh, getting the implementation right the intention is there uh, the conversation has come to the tables uh, the intention is there but it's just you know there are still trial and errors happening with the implementation uh, from what i've seen in my experience and uh, complementary to that we have this issue of public behavior where there is no understanding that you know such an infrastructure provision is made for uh, you know disability inclusion and that it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a leeway to start driving your two wheelers or other vehicles on a space that is not meant for you um, and i think that you know hampers the whole um, you know uh, the effort on trying to make our streets and public spaces inclusive and accessible Yeah, Sophia, can I? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, comment? please. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yes, so, uh, you know, now here, uh, there are two terms that we uh, are discussing. One is uh, two concepts, that's people, people-centric people design, and the second one is inclusive design. So, uh, the you know, I think uh, people-centric design is something that we are, uh, you know, mindfully doing. But the issue that is happening is about, you know, misunderstanding inclusive design. Uh, uh, in, in the right sense. I mean, there is inclusive design which is being practiced, but uh, are persons with disabilities or senior citizens really included uh, in, in the whole you know, user group that one is designing for is a question. Uh, I think we have started, uh, we have made a beginning and uh, you know, there are uh, some examples that are coming up in different parts of the country. There are some uh, street uh, examples, inclusive streets. Uh, some parks, uh, some waterfronts that have been made accessible. Uh, but the issue is, uh, you know, these are all happening in a very fragmented uh, manner and uh, a holistic uh, kind of an approach is not there. Uh, there are uh, exclusive uh, examples of, uh, you know, inclusive spaces, but uh, are they really, is there a connectivity between them is something that is, you know, an issue. How does one reach there? Right is is a question that one has to tackle. Only then can we really say that yeah we have made inclusive streets or inclusive cities or inclusive spaces. Uh, the proportion of inclusive people centric spaces or public spaces has definitely increased. Uh, you know, uh, considering the whatever it was in the past. But uh, now, while uh, heavy high value in uh, you know investment is being done in creating these public spaces. Are we really making these public spaces inclusive or accessible for all kinds of user groups, including persons with disabilities is certainly, you know, something that is questionable. I mean, there is a, a, a lot of investment happening, but, uh, and there are efforts, but those efforts are happening without technical understanding, thus ending up into errors. For example, uh, you know, uh, one that Vidyan shared was about the ramp, curb ramp. Uh, the other that I would like to share is about, uh, you know, tactile riding paths, which are uh, being put into these streets, but then are they really the, are these junctions, uh, you know, right, uh, instead of, uh, uh, you know, having wrong junctions and making them hazardous, it is better that one does not put and waste, you know, public money. So these are the questions, so capacity building, expertise, you know, uh, having the kind of uh, right awareness and orientation, uh, public awareness, of course, would come later, but I mean, the experts have to uh, uh, do it the right uh, way, right in the beginning, I would say. 
and uh, that is where uh, uh, you know we as experts can really bring uh, value to or bring bring the mo the momentum to the inclusive design uh, kind of efforts um one another uh, thing that i would really uh, stress upon is um, you know uh, a unified approach between all the implementing stakeholders needs to be there you know there are sporadic uh, efforts happening by different departments within different municipalities but uh, they are completely disconnected so while one is making the road department is making the streets but you know is there a coordination between the uh, uh, the public uh, transport department or the services or the garden department so everything has to you know kind of work in tandem and in a unified approach and so uh, 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 building a stronger kind of a uh, 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 network or connectivity or correspondence between departments so that uh, whatever is implemented is completely error free and can actually uh, you know achieve the kind of inclusion one is envisaging is something that i would like to stress upon so yeah that's that's all from thank you for sharing your thoughts i think some of the very important issues that came across one is the lack of awareness lack of capacity for the city's working teams and also importantly towards the end where the discussion went was that there are various stakeholders at play and there are different factors at play towards ensuring an inclusive design approach of streets and public spaces so building on that argument further i think it is also important to reflect on the challenges faced by cities in implementing such an approach in implementing an inclusive de design approach so my question is uh, open to you dr shalini you worked in the development sector for 20 years now and would you like to open the discussion on this front dr shalini we can't hear you Ma'am, we can't hear you still. Maybe I'll move the question to Mr. Pratik, who's the founder of Ramp My City. So your vision of doing on-ground accessibility interventions and what has your experience been so far? And what are your understandings in terms of the challenges that cities face in implementing an inclusive design approach? Uh, thank you, Sophia, and uh, thank you, um, NIUA, for having me here. Um, I want to congratulate the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and the Ministry of Social Justice for uh, putting in and bringing out uh, the Harmonized Guidelines 21. Um, we have brought out the policies and everything is there in the law. Uh, so, uh, and we have a document, standard document to refer to. So, when, when we talk about unawareness, what is unawareness about? Um, the architects are the are the schools which are teaching the architects and building new architects for us and the urban designers. Are they not studying the document enough? Or are there challenges that they're facing on ground? Or is there a last mile connectivity issue <clears throat> where the designs are passed by a government officer, passed on to the civic authorities, laid out by some other uh, agency, and then finally what comes out is, is not a product or not a design um, that a person with disability can use. Uh, footpaths are being made, but bolas are not wide enough thinking of two wheelers. When you have a fine system on traffic signals, why cannot you have a fine system for it? So uh, to exclude a few people to not using the footpath, you are excluding a whole community uh, for not using the footpath. Curve ramps are being made, but they're not as to standard. Tectiles are being placed, but they're broken and not, not maintained. Uh, parks are made, but only the entry is made accessible. And inside the park, the children's area or the gazebos are not accessible. Make um, So you have to come up with the idea of special parks then. Uh, schools are made, but with no access to any uh, children with disability or, or any policies in place where they can have more children with disabilities on board. Uh, PWD, PWD toilets are totally a miss. I don't see them. I see a lot of public toilets coming up but I do not see any PWD toilets coming up. Metros are made, 
um, but uh, the uh, even to access the metro for anybody who's having low vision, uh, the color contrasting uh, strips are missing. Um, and and all of this gets suddenly highlighted when when a central uh, when uh, an MP um, uh, goes and uses a wheelchair because of, of of some fracture and it becomes highlighted in the media that oh my god even the parliament is not accessible. So it is being brought into limelight in a way only when some other uh, celebrity goes into it uh, or goes through it. Uh, but actually, uh, when we talk about unawareness, uh, I don't think it's the issue of unawareness. It is um, the the authorities are not enforcing it properly. And because there's a whole chain uh, from right from where it is designed to the person who's executing it, there's a miss in that chain, which is actually leading uh, to wrong designs and us still struggling to be an accessible and inclusive nation. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Dr. Shalini, if you are back and if you would like to add in. Hello, Sophia, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, great. I'm so sorry. I wouldn't know what the problem was. So I disconnected and rejoined. And uh, uh, thanks for inviting me for this very wonderful discussion. I will speak very strictly on the basis of uh, the experience that I have so far of uh, being in teams where... Uh, uh, we were expected to give inputs as gender and social inclusion experts into uh, uh, so so what what kind of inclusive design features could be incorporated. Now the first problem that I see, which is very basic and yet very crucial, is um, uh, that in many a times in regular projects, uh, inclusive design features generally come as an afterthought, as an add-on. So uh, when it comes after the project has really been designed or even conceptualized, or even if it, the design is at an advanced stage, uh, this creates problems in terms of uh, delayed implementation, uh, logistical problems. Sometimes the budget and the cost estimates have to be uh, revised. And basically, since it has come as an afterthought, it remains an add-on. And there's limited ownership. There's limited buy-in by not just the stakeholders, but by also your other um, uh, project uh, uh, members. Now, uh, I've heard uh, Vidya's opinion about where we are in terms of mainstreaming, and I would really uh, like to state that uh, to a very great extent, this is a problem also of uh, uh, limited dissemination so far of this very wonderful body of work that has been done on inclusive design features. Uh, uh, there is definitely a paradigm shift, but uh, uh, for this to be really effective on a large scale and to make a difference, it has to be really percolate down to people who design projects, like uh, Vidya was talking about urban local bodies and your engineers, uh, at, on the one hand. And at the other level also, you have to disseminate, disseminate this amongst your policy makers so that there's a conducive environment, a, a buy-in there too. Um, uh, one more uh, problem that I see in the process of uh, adequate dissemination of this kind of work is the culture of the limited culture of public participation and public consultation that we still have. There has been a change in recent years, but I still think we really need to catch up on this. Otherwise, as long as the design elements and the inputs keep coming from experts or uh, our architects and planners and organizations, Unless the demand is really generated from below, we are not going to uh, be able to achieve scale. Uh, over to you, Sophia. Thank you for adding into it. I think what from what both of you shared, there's a lack of awareness. And from what Pratik particularly mentioned, that the issue is also not highlighted enough. And from what we are understanding is that there are issues at various levels of execution. And in that, I would like to uh, pull in Mr. Abhinav. You've been working on end-to-end -end project execution with Varanasi Smart City. And what is your take in terms of the issues with implementation and why an inclusive design approach is not as mainstreamed as we expect it to be? Yeah. Uh, am I audible to all? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, first of all, thanks uh, for this uh, to honoring uh, for honoring this uh, opportunity to speak as part of the panel. So I would straight away come to the challenges uh, which were discussed earlier and will add to what uh, uh, Pratik and Dr. Shalini had said. So basically, uh, 
there's a uh, although there, uh, there's a uh, during the design exercise uh, these uh, standards are referred to but there is a gap between what we design and what is implemented on site so there is a different team which is uh, working on the site there's a different you know the uh, working uh, scenario what uh, how the uh, contractual procedures are the tender award uh, things are monitoring and uh, uh, quality satisfaction as one part of it so there is a different uh, uh, scenario here where the there is a gap between the design team and the implementation team so we need to bridge this gap between these two uh, important entities first of all we have to design uh, we have to take into consideration all the parameters which are already there uh, and also impart that uh, the importance of these uh, particular aspects to the implementation implementation team here also comes the role of uh, the uh, auditors which give the uh, the approvals and sanctions for the designs they also have to there are already parameters set for the on policy level also there are uh, guidelines by nbcs and uh, cpwd uh, cpwd manuals but uh, on a sanction level or the approval levels we have to ensure that these parameters are adopted uh, uh, on the on the ground so secondly i would uh, further add to the stakeholder part which dr kavita had al already mentioned so uh, stakeholder uh, intervention uh, in fact stakeholder consultation is an important uh, part where these uh, implementation of these uh, uh, design uh, is is considered so what we have faced here in varanasi uh, i will focus basically on the implementation part where we have faced these challenges uh, on part of stakeholders so uh, this consultation part for the stakeholders is a very important uh, feature there are different people who uh, 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 who are impacted right on the site so there are these stakeholders who are directly impacted what uh, with the interventions which we do on a public street so when we talk about the closed campuses it is relatively easier because we have a defined space where uh, we can uh, work out the designs uh, design, uh, design parameters but when we come on to the public streets open public uh, urban areas the scenario is completely different there are different a lot uh, different set of stakeholders which are uh, directly impacted with the interventions and they need to be uh, aware of all the of the importance of these parameters the importance of inclusivity on a street and why we are designing that so uh, there are different people like uh, let's say in uh, in our context there were uh, traders association there were people in the market there were local citizens so there has to be a dialogue or there, there has to be a platform where all these people are uh, people are uh, put together and we can have a common discussion and we can uh, there are you know uh, in our case what happens is ki people do not want to change uh, how they are, have been practicing or what activities they have been doing on those streets so there it's a very difficult task to uh, transform these activities or uh, uh, tell these uh, people these stakeholders to change so they have to be imparted uh, with the uh, importance of these uh, parameters and we need to try, try to uh, mitigate the uh, these effects which Uh, the stakeholders will go through after going to through these interventions so uh, one is also when we talk about this urban streets there's the there's this uh, the traffic department which is an important uh, you know uh, you know i have i've seen uh, i will uh, talk in context of what happened in uttar pradesh there are different uh, streets where we worked earlier also in varanasi also so traffic department and also other department that are, uh, these uh, people have to be uh, put on board and they have uh, need to be uh, told what is the import importance of an inclusive street and most of all uh, if we make the street inclusive it's uh, it's uh, usable for all the people uh, automatically so they need to be uh, uh, told and uh, put on board whatever concerns are there regarding the traffic they need to be uh, sensitized so these are uh, two impo important aspects i talk uh, spoke about and uh, uh, other is uh, uh, other part is uh, the restriction of uh, the schedule so there are very uh, limited range of uh, these items you know uh, when we prepare a project uh, you know how the government uh, projects are uh, made there is a tender document there there is a bill of quantity entire bill of quantities uh, for which we refer the schedule of rates so there are very limited uh, uh, 
uh, options in the in the schedule items where we can adopt these uh, materials, these uh, uh, these works, the civil works which have to be carried out, or maybe the market items uh, uh, which are there in the uh, let's say the market items have to be adopted uh, in the schedule of rates. So we have we can have a wide range of uh, uh, products, wide range of items which we can implement on ground because you know. Uh, in a lot of government departments, they are restricted that you have to follow the existing schedule of rates only. So that we have to uh, take into account. And also, uh, we have to have uh, uh, a, a team, let's say a department who is expert in uh, implementing, identifying basically the identification of these departments who are who have a good record of implementing these activities. On a city level, these departments have to play a good role in uh, uh, in imparting their experiences or maybe uh, auditing uh, the other projects uh, agencies also so let's say take an ex taking an example from the smart city so there are, have been instances where the people have uh, told us to audit whether uh, this particular uh, project which we are considering in a let's say a ghat area whether it is uh, accessible or not or whether the ramps which have been considered there are uh, up to the uh, allowed gradient or the standard standard gradient or not so uh, the role of such de such departments can be identified in a uh, in an administrative uh, uh, scenario and they can play their important role for the auditing and uh, standardization of these uh, practices so that's all i uh, from from me from this side thank you thank you for sharing that i think you also briefly touched upon the how part of it and how can we really fix the gap that you rightly said is there in the design and implementation and one key to take away i would say from what you shared for me was that inclusive inclusive design approach should be taken right at the beginning and it cannot be something that comes as an add-on later for a project as well. Um, before we move ahead into the next aspect of it, I think, Vidya, is there anything that you would like to add in? You have your hand raised. Um, yeah, Sophie, I just want to add uh, from uh, the experience of working on the beach pathway, and um, I mean, I understand we're talking about gaps with regard to implementation. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, let's face it, right? So, so we don't have any parameters for evaluating any public space designs, you know, like across this country, we don't have any parameters that enable anyone, you know, at the planning stage or this implementation stage, we just don't have any of these, let alone accessible design as a parameter for evaluating designs, right? So that's why it doesn't translate to uh, the you know end product that we get off the ground right so uh, and somewhere it gets lost you know like um, as as designers I mean we work with the sensibility uh, of you know making uh, the public spaces that we are working with uh, accessible uh, I know that you know it goes uh, you know it crosses several stages you know and as um, Abhinav pointed out uh, our SORs are still, uh, you know, lacking in terms of accommodating several of these materi materials. Um, again, uh, reflecting back on the beach access pathway, uh, a lot of the struggle was actually to justify the materials that we were using, um, you know, given that it had to be CRZ compliant and it had to be accessible. And, you know, there was, uh, it, it, it took so many years simply because the materials would not get uh, approved and, you know, uh, getting market rates. Some of these, don't, you don't have the only market players for so many materials in the market as well right and uh, uh, it, it's mandated that we need to get three quotations where do I get three quotations if there's only one vendor offering a particular product that I need you know um, these are practical difficulties that happen at the planning uh, stage you know and then there are uh, the next thing is it goes into cost auditing and then uh, you know uh, at cost auditing, a lot of these costs don't get justified. They're like, why do you want to spend extra for this? Why can't we just do it the normal way? Take the standard SOR item, put it there. You have a railing, use the railing that's in the SOR. Why do you want to make the custom design the railing so that it, you know, is, uh, you know, um, suitable for uh, persons with disabilities and so on. So there's a whole struggle at the designer's end to get it across to the estimate stage where it, you know, we, where our design is not sort of lost. And we face this a lot, you know, like cutting down here, cutting down there and having to justify every single item on the BOQ is a huge challenge, especially when working with public agencies. Now, the next thing after you cross that is that because this is 
not again a parameter for evaluating the design and the output. The implementation agency, the contractor who comes on board has no sensib sensibility with regard to implementing projects of this nature. And the supervising engineers from the ULBs also don't have that you know, understanding or experience. All they know is again, you know, I need to install all of this. I need to check if it's there in the you know, uh, M book and that's it, I'm done with it, right? Uh, in the case of the beach project that we worked on, uh, I will say that uh, the ULB had a huge learning. The uh, engineers, um, also because it was a project that was just exclusively focused on accessibility, uh, there was a lot of learning on the ULB side. You know, I, it's very heartening that by the end of the project, they were able to, you know, call out the, you know, sort of nuances of the design and say, this is done for this reason so that these persons can use it uh, you know, and, um, you know, in, in a manner that, you know, does not hamper their safety or so on, like, they were able to call out these, uh, you know, um, aspects. And, and this happened because a project was designed that was entirely centered on the idea of accessibility. And therefore, there was no choice but to keep thinking about it day in and day out, you know, whether they were supervising or whether the contractor was working on it. In this case, there was no, uh, you know, there was no other way to do it. But if you want to, if it, if it if it goes into a larger public space and it's one among the parameters for judgment, uh, you know, then that's when it's sort of you know something gets prioritized more, you know, and then some, and then you know most of the time accessibility falls through the gaps. Uh, so there are multiple layers uh, levels through which this needs to traverse. You know, although the again the intentions may be there, the funding and the policy backing is still you know. Uh, like hampering the mainstreaming of it so that people are able to, you know, see these as defaults. Uh, I mean, and this is this is like every time I'm sure people who uh, visited cities abroad, you will see that a lot of cities look at it as a default, right? Like uh, moving around on a wheelchair is a is a default setting in in several uh, you know cities like London or so on. Uh, you don't have to. There are accessible maps. You can your public transport is accessible. Your streets are accessible, and it's nobody's like running a campaign on accessibility in these cities you know they've crossed all of those levels right now it's a default they don't do it any other way uh which is i think also goes back to my original comment of the fact that we're very far away from mainstreaming it it's only just come to the fore this topic of discussion and we've still got miles to go actually thank you vidya for bringing in that perspective akash would you like to add further to it Yeah, hi. Uh, so while I've been uh, listening and agreeing to most of uh, the comments uh, that have been made by Pratik and uh, the, you know, counter by Vidya of sorts, but uh, yeah, I mean, this problem uh, right now, uh, I mean, you could look at it from two ways. One is uh, having the base intra in place where uh, a lot of streets don't even have footpaths, you know, so we're like tackling that front. And then what gets built should get built in the best possible way so that we don't have to redo it or, you know. So I completely agree with, um, you know, the concerns that are being expressed here. And there are enough guidelines, they harmonize the, you know, the guidelines for uh, accessibility as well as IRC guidelines, which need to be followed. Uh, I do understand capacity issues um, uh, across the board, but what happens is, you know, uh, I would like to cite, there was a time in Delhi when uh, we had an organization called UTPEC. We still have, by the way. So uh, these guys, what, what uh, we used to do there, I remember, like any street project would, you know, kind of get discussed on the table where there would be representatives by um, traffic police, uh, by PWD services, electrical, uh, you name it, all the guys who have anything to do with, uh, you know, the public space were on the same table. And they would discuss that particular project, uh, you know, uh, discuss the problems uh, coming through and then um, kind of come to resolutions, which would, you know, cut across different departments. Like in Delhi, uh, if you're doing a street, a park will belong to somebody else. So the park edge or the street edge, if you, if you want to integrate that, it's not, uh, it's not something that you can just draw up and, you know, uh, wish it 
to happen. It will never happen because, you know, the, the two agencies are not talking. So things like that. I mean, you know, so uh, if we can think of a framework by where, you know, uh, public realm design comes under one kind of a umbrella, uh, chaired by a really high office, uh, which then, you know, can call in all these people. And then, uh, you know, all your projects can be lined up uh, to follow the guidelines, to have joint presentations, to, you know, be discussing uh, design issues, uh, cutting across, like most of the examples I was giving you were, you know, uh, things to do at the city level. I mean, if, if I'm doing a street and there's a park next door or the lake next uh, abutting it, I mean, I don't want my street to do what it has to do and not even acknowledge that. So as a city, it doesn't work. So we really need to kind of broad base our uh, discussion on uh, you know the inclusivity of it and bring in everything that is there in public open space and put it on the table and discuss it and come to a conclusion. Now, um, in in UTPEG, they actually uh, did some, you know, like uh, everything, by the way, whatever we're doing, uh, most of it, uh, like somebody uh, rightly said, will be the first stop because we, ha we don't have too much of, you know, like examples to follow. Uh, locally. So like uh, when uh, the metro got built into Delhi, uh, you know, even now in Chennai, I mean, I'm, I'm still, you know, uh, the metro problem of having parking at the station. Like there's a concept called park and ride. It's like you come to the metro station, park your car and then get onto the metro and then uh, take your trip. Now what happens to, you know, the all the people who are traveling on the metro, they have to come down the exit and then you suddenly land up in a parking lot. That's not the best experience. So, I mean, inclusivity, it's not only about, you know, uh, setting some standards uh, and fixing it, but also the experiences that we uh, allow for these open spaces. So MMI multimodal integration at the metro station was something that UTIP uh, started championing. And we were like, uh, you know, there with the pilot project and we put it up. So there were no standards. What I'm saying is somebody has to, you know, kind of negotiate that first off and, you know, put something uh, down as a policy which the city agrees and then it can take off. And then the auditing. Now, when a UTPEC approves a project and that project get built out, there was a policy where audits would happen. Like most of you have talked about audits. So who is doing the audit? And what is the sanctity of that audit? What, which group is empowered to do it? And if you know that your permissions are coming through a body and they're going to check it, I mean, everybody has to make sure. Right now, I mean, all our designs, uh, like uh, the one I was telling you about the problem with Polax, they never get implemented because there's no, no, you know, like no fear of any audit or any, uh, you know, repercussion on that to, that will happen. So if we want a good implementation, which I think is the end goal, uh, for everyone, then I think these are processes which uh, uh, ought to be followed. I think the example is uh, something fantastic which uh, everyone could, you know, look up and try to model around different cities. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that out. Um, Dr. Kavita, we are actually running short of time. I would request you to drop your comments in the chat box or we'll get back to you towards the end if that is okay for you. I'll move to um, Shivani Shah next. Shivani, your organization works on building an accessibility information system. Would you like to share a few thoughts on how technology plays a role in ensuring seamless access for all? Or what are your thoughts on how do we really ensure seamless access for everyone in our cities? Right. Um, thank you, NIUA. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, so this question that can we really ensure seamless access for all uh, always finds a space in all kinds of discussion which focuses on inclusive design. And we all understand and can't deny the fact that disability is a spectrum and within each disability type, there is a lot of diversity. And then there are persons with multiple disability, combination disability, associated conditions. So uh, how do we really look at this question that uh, can a design element really cater to the needs of all and when we say all are we referring to a particular demography or a cluster or are we referring to each person within that diversity so i think this always is a very uh, 
difficult situation to deal with. And so what is the way for it? Um, so whenever we talk about inclusive design at public spaces, we spend a lot of time focusing on the elements of built space and, you know, tactile tiles and ramps. And we, we, we look at a lot at infrastructure, physical infrastructure. And uh, a lot of times what really misses out from the conversation is the need to have products, assistive devices and adapted products and how it really impacts a person's journey while they are navigating in the city. Uh, for an example, um, uh, I'll give you an example, and that is where from we talk about accessibility is important, but at the same time, we should really start talking about the concepts of reasonable accommodation. And when accessibility and reasonable accommodation works hand in hand, that is when we can really see uh, you know, seamless access happening for all. One of the examples I think uh, some of you might know that we recently had a Purple Fest event in Goa, which was in India's first inclusive festival. And I think it was, uh, uh, there was no precedent for such a festival to happen. It was brilliantly organized and executed. And it made sure that it had all of these physical elements in place. Uh, at the same time, a lot of people from various disabilities uh, were there in the fest and then there was this washroom area which had a ramp which had tactile indicators which had signages everything that you your guidelines would tell you to have and uh, but uh, what was very interesting was that one of my colleagues she has cerebral palsy and she has very limited um, hand functions and she can't even reach to a tap uh, so uh, at purple fest they collaborated with a startup which they were uh, producing certain kind of devices that could help person with limited mobility also to reach out. So we are what we are talking about is we have to move from the guidelines and also to look at what is other what is happening at the uh, other end. How are these uh, assistive tech industries developing, and is there a way to collaborate so that you know we can ensure that things happen for all. Uh, another example uh, I, I can tell you, which is a very basic modification we do at our uh, organization, which is a, a very normal cylindrical foam pipe, which comes in the market. You can buy it on Amazon. Now, a lot of our colleagues, you keep that cylindrical pipe in the bag. It's like a foam sheet. In the bag, always when they're going around in the metros or when they're going around in the bus. And whenever they're using a public toilet, they'll Get, get that cylindrical pipe out, put it on the, you know, uh, tap or anything. And uh, that elongates the tap to a certain degree that they can really hold it. So now we are looking at solutions, uh, particular problems and solutions uh, at this level. So we are really zooming into each element and seeing how can it work. And this thing can only happen if in the, in, in, in our design discussions, we really look at, okay, what is, what are the local solutions that people have been adapting for so many years and they have been making their lives easier navigating. And can we really look at those local solutions plus also see uh, collaborations happening between uh, these product and tech startup and also uh, stakeholders that are focusing on design implementation at a public level. So I think uh, this is a very powerful way to ensure that uh, we, cater to all people we also bring in local solutions at the same time if we bring in these solutions as a part of our design uh, or as a part of our strategy maybe we can also look at can we really lower the prices of these products in the market so that all the people can afford it so a little bit government and the design stakeholders can do to ensure accessibility and little bit uh, people who really want to and uh, really want to navigate the city with disabilities can really do on their front if the products are subsidized available on subsidized rate if we can create awareness about uh, you know where are these products available and what can be done and how can you you, re you really use it when you are navigating city spaces so i think uh, this is a uh, this is an approach one should really look at now uh, and that is one way of ensuring seamless access to all the users, is what I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Shivani, for sharing that. I think what all of us are saying very strongly is that we've come this far, but there is a long way to go for mainstreaming inclusive design approaches for streets and public spaces in the country. And on this note, I will move to the last bit of the discussion 
which is to understand what are some of the policy changes required to mainstream inclusive design of streets and public spaces in the country. And for that, I would like to invite Dr. Kavita, Dr. Shalini and Pratik to share your thoughts on this. I would also request all of you to please keep it a little brief as we are running short of time. We would like to wrap up in the next 10 minutes or so. Over to you, Dr. Kavita. Yes, thank you, Sophia. So um, uh, talking about policies, I think uh, you know India has a good law uh, that protects the rights of persons with disabilities. It has sufficient policies which have been very well framed uh, to implement the law and to uh, ensure that the rights are protected. We have now guidelines like harmonized guidelines, which have been uh, updated recently and uh, you know, by, uh, by uh, leading institutions who have been working um, on uh, accessibility and universal design. Uh, there is also uh, guidelines on the budget allocation that needs to be done, uh, who, uh, uh, you know, who is responsible for it, uh, uh, be it private or public has been very clearly mentioned. Uh, the protocols or the procedures to be followed have been put in into the law as well as the policies. The question about you know uh, who does the audits or when is when are the audits supposed to be made? Uh, what is the frequency like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything has been mentioned very clearly in the policy as well as guidelines. NIUA has made a couple of documents and you know manuals uh, which can guide people on uh, this and has widely disseminated. Uh, conducted uh, India-wide uh, awareness and uh, capacity building programs as well. So I think all of that is there, but the, the so the the policy is there. The issue is with the ownership and the enforcement. I mean, you know, this whole question about who owns this whole uh, you know mandate of implementing accessibility is something that is is you know being missed out is it the government who is supposed to you know within the government is it the ministry of social justice the uh, office of commissioner of disabilities or whether it is you know each each uh, uh, department each ministry each uh, organization be it government or non government um, whether it is an individual or the architect or the urban designer or the stakeholder for that matter so I think you know the ownership has been has to be taken at an individual level. I would like to share here, you know, um, uh, three examples. One, I would like to start with the inclusive uh, fest that happened at Purple Fest, and we were really fortunate to be the uh, you know accessibility uh, uh, I would say consultants or you know people who were uh, I mean the the uh, uh, the stakeholder was ensuring that all uh, facilities are accessible and thank you Shivani for endorsing it as uh, one of the visitors to the fest and you know the, the ownership was taken up by the state and uh, uh, also in a very very inclusive and a participatory way where all the organizations related to disabilities were brought on board. And everything was, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, planned, discussed uh, together uh, with a very proactive approach. And, and every last mile connectivity was including how one reaches to the uh, fest site to, you know, all small facilities that were uh, included in the site. So I think that participatory approach and the ownership taken by the government. Now, in the second project that we are doing, it's a rehabilitation uh, center for persons with disabilities. It's the District Disability Rehabilitation Center. Again, you know, the government uh, took an inclusive approach and a participatory approach where all the uh, DPOs uh, uh, were invited on board, all the experts were invited on board, and a, a, a access a steering committee was created, which actually uh, brought all these discussions on board. Everybody's challenges were uh, discussed. And then, you know, with a common consensus, uh, the plans and the designs and the implementation has been finalized so that there are no uh, gaps left out. Now, uh, here to, you know, um, the procedures that went into are, of course, you know, uh, the, the tendering process or, you know, the bringing in the schedule of rates. Uh, there was effort made to bring in, uh, you know, uh, all those specialized items and get it as, uh, approved as and included into the schedule of rates which owner, uh, as, uh, as an architect, we took the owners and got it done. So again, you know, putting it onto yeah, that who does it is again a question. So when we have to take the ownership, we have to ensure that we do it at our end and we uh, do whatever is required for it. The third one, again, which is the inclusive park at Kolkata, 
again the procedure was we started with capacity building of the uh, all the stakeholders including nkda so you know the implementing authority the the uh, the agency who gave the land the persons who have uh, the agency who gave, who is funding the uh, thing and the agency who is executing uh, there have been multiple rounds of capacity building for them uh, uh, you know uh, in terms of technical uh, technicalities in terms of the uh, errors that could happen in terms of what is who are the user groups sensitizing about them so i think taking everybody on board and having a kind of a you know uh, a, a clarity and as well as a, uh, uh, as uh, as well as you know building capacity before we actually embark on executing things because then there there is a guarantee that yes errors would be you know minimal and everybody would be working with the same spirit and you know uh, with the same kind of a vision so uh, my suggestion would be what we need is you know uh, very uh, policies that will strengthen the enforcement of uh, this mandate uh particularly the rpwd act and for this uh, you know there could be uh, incentives that could be worked out uh, for uh, uh, you know uh, promoting uh, or for encouraging private as well as public organizations to implement it as well as penalties so what, where we lack is actually even the penalization so what if one doesn't really implement it so before we do that we need to see that you know uh, the rpwd uh, sorry the bylaws have been um com are compliant to the harmonized guidelines as well as the uh the national building code we, once that is done then we sh we need to have a procedure that stops any building from getting sanction without the necessary accessibility measures in place then a process a procedure where these implemented proceed uh, measures are audited are checked and ratified by uh, an identified expert and then finally a sanction given uh, to to make the building you know get constructed the way uh, without without any accessibility breach uh, so i think uh, uh, what every city needs or every town needs is a access steering committee so maybe at a state level or a city level where uh, all the uh, stakeholders are there and every project every uh, uh, you know proposal that is uh, uh, that is going to be uh, taken up is vetted by this access steering committee and then only you know kind of so that access steering committee not just becomes a vetting agency but also becomes the point where everybody's challenges can be discussed can be brought to the table yeah that okay you know the traffic uh, department has this kind of an issue where if if one is doing this or you know the road department is having another issue etc so everything that can be brought on one table discussed and with common consensus decisions can be made and then uh, you know a kind of a uh, unified approach or a more uh, uh, collective or uh, uh, you know um, uh, i would say well coordinated uh, effort can be put in to ensure that uh, you know the mandate for inclusion or you know the inclusive spaces is met so um i think uh, we need more champions out there uh, and we we there is an opportunity for us to champion uh, this as well thank you so much thank you thank you for bringing that out um dr shalini would you like to add more to this and then we'll uh, hand it over to prateek for some closing remarks from him Dr. Sharini, we can't hear you. Pratik, maybe you could go ahead first by the time maybe yeah. she'll be able to reconnect. Yeah, um, I think uh, Kavita brought it out very beautifully that there has to be in a, in a country which is still learning to be accessible and we're learning to be inclusive. It's we are very new to it. Um, as um, Akash pointed out, that the various the power lies in the hands of various stakeholders. As Vidya said, that uh, um, there are no uh, vendors out there who will you compete the court against. It's it's the beginning of our journey, and in the beginning of the journey, um, who who does the ownership lie with? And I think that is where uh, government has to play a significantly stronger role uh, to bringing all this together so that. Um, if you want to be accessible, you don't have to go to 10 agencies, but it is all under one, one agency where um, you get your work done. Uh, secondly, I think there has to be a larger presentation of the PWD community. 
in the decision making process because right now we are far underrepresented and what a pwd community i do not see a lot of pwd leaders out there who are a part of decision making process there are a few but we need larger presentation so um, in the decision making process a uh, few things uh, that are required for us to um, to accelerate the growth and to build an inclusive india is uh, bring all these different stakeholders who might be having their own agendas into one umbrella for accessibility second um, higher representation of the disabled community of the pwd community and thirdly the government has to play a role because accessibility is new to india we are learning we all are learning and there is no precedence and in this journey um, it is the government's primary role to make sure um, to how to make sure that uh, what is what is put out by the design team is implemented by the implemented uh, implementation team and what is done by the implementation team is eventually used by the pwd user so that's my couple of cents on it thank you for sharing that dr shalini are you back and if we could hear some closing remarks from you as well sofia can you hear me yes we can hear you now i'm so sorry uh, so um, since we are running out of time uh, i would like to talk very broadly and very quickly about the larger policy framework which i think is important for all of us to keep in mind and this is particularly in in the in the context of the sustainable development goals so i see this entire body of work on inclusive uh, uh, design of cities and urban spaces uh, at the intersection of not one but actually uh, at least four sdgs uh, the connection with sdg 11 on cities and how we want inclusive safe and resilient and sustainable cities is quite obvious but we also have the sdg 13 on climate change uh so this is there is a connection here we cannot have inclusive uh, without inclusive cities we cannot have uh, resilient cities and we can't have uh, uh, resilient communities unless uh, all our disadvantaged groups can access public spaces uh, most importantly however i would like to point to the connection with sdg 5 which is on uh, gender equality and women's empowerment and i'm sure we all have read about how um uh, Uh, women's access to uh, public spaces or lack of access to public spaces affects their access to employment basic services the education leisure well-being etc there are actually studies which show that the quality of your public space uh, determines the pattern of crime against women and that in turn uh, uh, affects their pattern of employment there are also studies which show that uh, uh women who are uh, generally constrained from using uh, public spaces are also more likely to be left out of decision making processes so a lot of work is still being done on this so it is this connection with sdg 5 gender equality and women's empowerment which i would like to uh, stress upon uh more specifically we have a national policy for women uh, the draft of which has been in circulation since i think 2016 now this policy comes close to talking about uh, women's access of public spaces and public transport um, <clears throat> it may sound a little far fetched but i would still like to propose that we consider the possibility of uh, including a reference to inclusive design features of cities within this policy document so getting getting in a commitment uh, from this policy that's all from my end sophia thank you thank you thank you so much since we are running short of time we won't be able to take questions from the audience live and also for the panelists if you have any more thoughts i would encourage you to please drop these in the chat box as we are running short of time right now um i would like to hand it over back to kanika now to take the webinar forward and a big thank you to all the panelists and all the attendees for making the discussion highly engaging and a memorable one for us thank you thank you thank you so much sofia and thank you to all the panelists for uh, actually engaging in a very very enriching and insightful discussion um before uh, moving forward i would like to invite uh, uh, shri rahul kapoor director smart city mission uh, to give his um, address uh, and enrich us all with your thoughts uh, over to you sir uh thank you so much uh, kanika and first of all i'd like to apologize i was supposed to give the opening and set the context here but here i am after listening to the the various panelists on this group and now also reading the questions that have been posted on what is the thought 
of the various participants on the discussion that took place. First of all, uh, thank you to the entire panel. I think that was a very, very interesting discussion that we had today. Uh, what I would just like to mention here, of course, uh, we all understand the importance of street and public spaces and how they are at the center of public life in our cities. They provide safe and comfortable space to rest, to play, to travel, and also to spend time. And whether we see that uh, the pedestrian plazas uh, that have been developed in cities like Chennai under the Smart Cities mission or the Chandni Chowk uh, development over the last decade. So we have seen and witnessed that the creation of uh, streets and public spaces are now beginning to incorporate inclusive design elements. So these design elements basically that cater to the needs of everybody. So when you talk about inclusive, the idea I think is that something that takes everyone along that is able to accommodate everyone. And when you're trying to do that, it requires striking the right balance from the various different user groups. And believe me, it's not an easy task to arrive at a consensus. I mean, uh, <laughs> with uh, more and more user groups having their own specific needs, and when you're trying to balance it out together, sometimes it tends to happen that the more vociferous group uh, tends to dominate uh, these discussions. And that's where things start going all over the place for the other user groups. And we start making more exclusive rather than inclusive. So of course, incorporating inclusive design principles is not only the right thing, but also the smart thing. And that is where cities uh, have to be designed to be accessible and welcoming to everyone. As a way of making it more inclusive, you will also be attracting a lot of businesses. Uh, you'll be attracting more tourists, the more workers, basically making the economy more vibrant. So it has a lot of positive effects, you know. So I think the investments that go into making infrastructure more accessible, more inclusive, uh, does have its benefits. So you also have to look at the social benefits that come along with such projects. Uh, we talked about, uh, as I was going through the questions in the panel, uh, the need for standardization in this regard, uh, the need to have curriculums as part of architectural uh, courses or the guidelines that need to be issued or the specifications that we need to have when we are talking about street design. Uh, all these are very, very relevant. And uh, as a central government, as uh, an institute, uh, we have National Institute of Urban Affairs, which is uh, trying to incorporate such kind of changes in the policy design. So the policy landscape is evolving. It is becoming more and more promising. So as Mahua, we did come up with the harmonized guidelines and standards for universal accessibility in India. So there have been revisions in the URDPFI guidelines and ABLE India accessibility assessment frameworks. And along with that, we're also trying to create a data ecosystem as part of the urban outcome framework, wherein a lot of uh, key uh, performance indicators or uh, data points that are relevant uh, from accessibility and inclusivity point of view are being uh, collated, collected from more than 200 plus cities. So if you are able to measure if the master plan or the city development plans include adequate uh, provisions for persons with disabilities, or whether the total number of government establishments are providing universally accessible environments for persons with disabilities, will basically provide the necessary inputs that go into the, or the evidence that will go into uh, decision making. So uh, I think these are certain important steps we are going to take, but we also need to understand one thing. Uh, you may have a lot of technical solutions to these technical problems, you know, by coming out with guidelines, design specifications, but the whole problem is not only technical, it also requires a change in uh, overall behavior of the people who are involved, the decision makers, the other stakeholders, the other user groups, a bit of sensitization, a bit of awareness about the need for making such kind of uh, city design more inclusive. And of course, uh, with regard to the decision makers as well, and how do you affect decision making in that regard? So yes, you need to address the technical issues, but you also need to uh, address the more adaptive kind of challenges that come about. I think that is something that we need to work on in this journey of becoming more inclusive. And as a ministry, we have tried to do that through the various initiatives like the India Cycles for Change and Streets for People Challenges, within nine cities have uh, across India have adopted a healthy street policy. And basically 18 cities are in the process of adoption of a healthy street policy for themselves. So it will highlight the importance of inclusive design. It will ask cities to work towards adopting street design guidelines that ensure the same. 
and cities who are commencing these journeys towards becoming more inclusive, uh, becoming more nurturer, nurturing, and uh, can do so through multiple uh, steps like institutional steps, such as adoption of policies, setting up a dedicated group of workers within them, or adopt design guidelines that prioritize inclusive designs, or capacity development and awareness building for the various stakeholders involved. So along with the technical issues, you can also address some of these adaptive issues like uh, awareness, communication, and behavior change. So I think homegrown best practices are definitely very important as we learned in this webinar today. It uh, has offered us much needed insights on the local interventions that are effective or have been effective, more suitable to the Indian context. So in line with the U20 priority area of championing local identity, we must look at local solutions for planning effective urban mobility, public space spaces, and even more. So with India assuming the presidency of the G20, I think this is the right time to catalyze a sustainable, inclusive, and equitable growth in Indian cities and catering to the needs of the rapidly growing urban population. Uh, with that, I close my address. Thank you so much, the entire ITDP team, all the panelists, and all the various participants who have joined us today uh, for this session. Thank you so much. Over to you, Kanika. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it actually very well summarized the entire discussion which we had. Um, going forward, um, it's not an easy task to actually summarize all the important points which has been discussed in this uh, particular webinar. Uh, starting from uh, the uh, very, very insightful presentation made by Vidya um, on the uh, Chennai Beach Accessibility Project and the various initiative Chennai City has been uh, taking up uh, to mainstream uh, inclusion of uh, persons with disability and other marginalized group. Um, the Museum of Possibility seemed to be a very uh, promising and an insightful example which has been presented along with the various challenges um, which has been, which uh, she mentioned uh, um, during the course of uh, construction of the beach uh, accessibility project. Uh, then uh, um, Akash presented a very comprehensive view on uh, the entire uh, definition of inclusivity. Uh, inclusivity as a word itself has many interpretation um, among many many stakeholders, and um, his presentation was a was a very beautiful interpretation of the various um, meanings of the word inclusion. Um, focused on uh, starting uh, with the economic and the behavioral aspects, which elaborated the need to create cities for all. Uh, Mind tree, another uh, beautiful example from the city of Bangalore, um, Kabin Park, which is actually the lung of the city and uh, it has been visited by so many people uh, throughout the day for so many different purposes. I am sure that um, having an inclusive park will not only be benefited for the uh, children with disability, but also will create a, a sense of um, um, sensitization among the people who are visiting that park for uh, so many, like, you know, um, having so many beautiful interpretation uh, interventions into it. Kavitaji has also also, uh, um, like you know, um, presented the intervention done uh, in collaboration uh, with the um, authorities in New Kolkata. Um, another uh, very beautiful example um, and a best practice which can actually be replicated in many other cities. Uh, the presentation also demonstrated the power of collaboration and participatory approach, which need to be adopted um, in um, all the projects, uh, all the projects in public realm. Um, coming to the uh, panel discussion, there were uh, many aspects, um, uh, starting with um, the, the first and the foremost principle of universal accessibility of try and error. Uh, so having a, um, tolerance for error is uh, one of the key components or key principle of universal accessibility, which was also discussed uh, um, in, the, in the panel discussion. Uh, the panel discussion broadly covered a few aspects uh, uh, ranging from behavioral change, um, awareness among the uh, public, uh, among uh, various stakeholders, um, building the capacities uh, to be more equipped with the needs of persons with disabilities, uh, gender, um, urban poor, and other marginalized groups. Um, standard and implementation, uh, the uh, coherence between having guidelines and standards and its implementation, what Pratik uh, rightly mentioned about uh, uh, monitoring and uh, the operation phase, the significance of having uh, uh, inclusive design uh, in the entire project cycle was uh, another thing which was discussed um, uh, by many panelists. 
the buy-in from the policy makers, uh, the other stakeholders, um, the coherence um, um, between the designers and the implementees, implementers, architects, engineers, um, auditors, um, uh, inclusion in uh, guidelines and standard and other statutory procedures, including sanction, approval, um, and how a consultative approach uh, is, uh, again, something which is very important in uh, to be integrated into the entire cycle. Um, the among the policy intervention, there were a couple of ideas which actually uh, were very interesting. Um, having uh, one umbrella framework um, um, for all the projects under the public will, um, making a joint presentation to bring all the stakeholders on board um, at once and uh, um, having a seamless uh, implementation thereafter is um, one of the proposals which came across. Um, um, the, other one is, um, um, you know, having a steering committee uh, for steering committee for uh, accessibility, which can actually overlook that accessibility has been uh, uh, kind of uh, act as a vetting agency and integrate um, um, accessibility into every aspect again uh, from right from uh, the bylaws making uh, making the bylaws compare compilent to the harmonized guidelines ensuring incentives and pen, uh, penalties which can actually be integrated into the statutory system and sensitization that could actually make uh, uh, the policy implementation uh, faster uh, was another um, suggestion um, and then the last one is uh, like you know um, having a larger representation of persons with disabilities um, in the decision making process is um, another thing. The last uh, was that, you know, we should actually be uh, working towards the larger commitment which India has um, uh, from the SDG, the four SDGs of uh, um, the um, like inclusive uh, inclusion is actually inherent to all the climate uh, sustainable development goals and making uh, uh, um, like, you know, uh, linking all our efforts to the larger sustainable goals, particularly sustainable development goal 11, uh, which is towards making more inclusive cities and working at the interse uh, intersectionalities of um, gender, persons with disabilities and other marginalization is something which is the key. Um, integration into um, policies like the national policy for women, which is uh, at present in its draft stage, could be one of the steps in the right direction. Uh, this, um, this actually broadly captures uh, the essence and uh, um, you know highlights the importance of having a very uh, comprehensive outlook towards inclusion and universal accessibility. Um, it not only highlights how uh, inclusion of uh, persons with disability and universal accessibility should actually be integrated into the entire uh, from project formulation to project conceptualization, implementation and monitoring. It needs to be integrated into every aspect, but also highlights that there are uh, there are aspects which are more, uh, more like you know, uh, which which need to be more researched upon, more talked upon, more deliberated upon. Um, so, uh, like the last um, agenda of gender equality and um, um, exploring, like you know, uh, what actually can be done when we are standing at a um, at an intersection of, let's say, disability and gender, or gender and urban poor, or disability and urban poor. There's something which which needs to be uh, deliberated upon more. This actually um, gives up gives us the opportunity to call upon more ideas for topics which we can take up for our next webinar. So it's an open call for all the attendees, uh, even the panelists and the speakers, to suggest us with more uh, interesting topic which you want to um, hear from um, another set of uh, brilliant panelists. Um, on that note, I would like to thank uh, Rahul sir for gracing us with his presence and giving a um, beautiful uh, concluding uh, address. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all our panelists, speakers, attendees, and uh, um, participants for being a part of this webinar. Um, I would like to thank ITDP and the basic team at NIUA for their contribution in making this webinar a big success. Um, thank you all and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.